Since 1972, International Street has been a centerpiece of Kings Island. For millions of visitors, this is the first step they take into this magical place, where beloved characters are waiting to greet them with wide smiles and big hugs. This is also a place where families gather to take that picture so that this moment can be frozen in time forever. In this segment, we're going to take a stroll down International Street, discover some history, and find out why this place is so special for many of us. Two or three things that Coney Island did not have that were the wave of the future. Coney Island experimented uh, in terms of when you got on the rides, how you paid. In, in the 40s and 50s, uh, you paid cash. If you wanted to ride a coaster, you paid a quarter. Then we went to a universal ticket system, and then we went to a modified pay one price system where you got a string around your, you know, the band, and you paid five dollars, and you got the band, and you could ride all day with that. Then when we opened Kings Island, it was obviously pay one price. You paid to get in. Now I got to tell you, uh, Coney Island those days it cost fifty or seventy-five cents to get in the park. And we're announcing this new theme park where it's going to cost $6 to get in the park. And I'll tell you, we had a real public relations nightmare in front of us because, number one, the world loved Coney Island. Cincinnati absolutely loved Coney Island. They loved the Island Queen. They loved the swimming pool. They loved Moonlight Gardens. Everybody grew up there. They fell in love there. You're going to tear all this down and get rid of it? You're crazy. And then you're going to build something up north and charge us $6 to get in? <laughs> Um, we, we, we really, uh, had, when we were under construction at Kings Island, we had as many tours as possible of people through there and press and, and so forth. But I'll tell you, it, you, you never knew how, I, I honestly think I knew, I thought it was a no brainer trying to do this thing. But when you're putting up the money, as Taft Broadcasting did, it's not quite a no-brainer. It's a risk. It's a gamble. And, and, and I always admire them for that because even though we were all pretty sure of this thing, uh, you never know until the people came in. Pay one price was a big deal. And we got over that public relations deal. And once we did, everybody loved pay one price because they, they paid this money and then they had the psychology as everything else is free all day. So it was a great concept. Well, we designed our entrance to be very, very low. So when you came up and bought your tickets, you didn't quite know what you were getting into. You didn't know what was on the other side of this and what you were going to see. And in spite of trying to advertise for this and tours and everything else, uh, we had the, the people who came up in the beginning, they paid their money and they walked through there. And, and I'll tell you, it was just fun to stand there. Their jaws dropped. Because in spite of the fact they loved Coney Island, Coney Island wasn't in the same league with Kings Island. They looked down International Street, they saw that fountain, they saw the tower, and I, you know, I, I knew we had a winner. I absolutely knew we had a winner because it's like the best movie you ever saw. It's word of mouth. You tell 15 people about this movie, and that's really what happened. When we started planning Kings Island, uh, Gary Walks went out to California and he met with a fellow by the name of... Uh, Bruce Bushman, and he was really the conceptual designer of particularly International Street. His father was the famous uh, silent movie star Francis X. Bushman, uh, and uh, Bruce Bushman came to Cincinnati and stayed here a while, worked on International Street for us, and what we wanted to do was create this boulevard with a lot of shops and, and retail area with this beautiful fountain. Many lifelong relationships were made at this park. And one shining example of those relationships is the love between Walter Jr. Duff and Nancy Gunther. I'm Walter Duff. I work at Front Gate Hats and Souvenirs, and I started in 1978. Hi, I'm Nancy Duff. I worked in the merchandise department also at Kings Island, and I worked in the Rivertown section of the park in the trading post. The other thing we didn't have in Coney Island was a big merchandising department. We had a, uh, we had a uh, games department. But we didn't have a lot of merchandising. And I knew International Street was, you know, shop, shop, shops. So I was, uh, among other things, I was pretty heavily involved with United Appeal in the 60s. 
And uh, one of the guys was one of my key guys who ran McGalpin's in Mount Washington. And uh, I remembered him and I said, God, we need a merchandiser. So I went up and I talked to this fellow. I said, how would you like to get in our business? And you can do all the shops on International Street. Uh, the great thing I loved about working uh, front gate shops were every day I had a great view of the uh, International uh, Eiffel Tower and I got to see the air show every single day. So most people don't remember, but they had parachuters, they had the uh, dog fights, they had hot air balloons. So uh, about five o'clock or seven o'clock, somewhere in that time range, every day I got to see the air show. International Street was uh, very unique, I think, for the time, especially for Cincinnati and a few of the theme parks. International Street was themed with German shop, the Swiss shop, the French shop. Everything had souvenirs from around the world there. And also many souvenirs that were very specific to just Kings Island. The Eiffel Tower, I mean, I, I got tired of seeing the Eiffel Tower as far as on the shelves. There were millions of Eiffel Towers that we sold um, there. But International Street had great flavor, um, great themes to it. The restaurants and the shops were completely themed out. You really did think you were in another country knew we wanted a massive fountain. I, I'd seen some beautiful fountains at the New York World's Fair. It had taken a million slides of them. Well, the fountain was, yeah, absolutely there. That was the brainchild and uh, pet project of a fellow by the name of Charlie Flat, who, who loved water and uh, was a former manager of the Coney Island Sunlight Pool. And Charlie worked very hard uh, on that project, and, uh, and we developed it. It was the longest fountain, uh, certainly in the United States at that time. I believe it was uh, 300 feet long and had several, 300 and some lights underneath it that changed uh, uh, with, a, with a computer program. So it was very unique and uh, it became, uh, and is today, still one of the more beautiful spots within Kings Island. The Eiffel Tower, interestingly enough, was originally planned to be put at Coney Island and it was put on hold. If you remember at Coney Island there was a ride called the Lost River and the Lost River was going to be torn down and, and the Eiffel Tower was going to be put there. Uh, Gary Walks had, uh, and his family had met with uh, uh, the team from uh, Intamin AG out of uh, Zurich, Switzerland, who built towers of that nature and had it ordered basically, ready to go, and then the idea of Kings Island came up, so it was put on hold. Well, that became the focal point of Kings Island as we built the street, designed the street, and the esplanade of, of International Street around that. The tower was built in Graz, Austria. And they built that park over there and then they, they pre-assembled sections of it and then took it apart and they shipped it over here. And that tower went up and they only had to re-grout 26 bolts in the entire tower. It was the Mercedes-Benz of Eiffel Towers. And it's hard to believe, but we built that tower, including these massive foundations, elevators, paint, lock, stock, and barrel for a million four. Lord knows what that would cost today. It is an icon in the area, and it became the meeting place for everybody at Kings Island. When families would break up, they would come back and say, we'll meet you at the Eiffel Tower at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. So that's how the Eiffel Tower came into being. At Coney Island, we did not have a strong live show program. We knew what we didn't have. We knew what was popular with the new theme parks. We knew what we had to get. So we went out and hired a guy named Jack Rouse. Uh, I, I hired Jack from the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And uh, Jack and his friend Carmen De Leon, they were going to do the live shows for Kings, uh, for, uh, Kings Island. Carmen De Leon lasted a year and he decided, this carnival business is not for me. But Jack Rouse stayed on. And they did a marvelous job. And in fact, in the first year, uh, we, we kind of ran out of money. We did not, we weren't able to do everything we wanted to do because we went over budget in some areas because it was all so new and it was very hard to predict. In the early years of the theme park industry, parks largely differentiated themselves on their live entertainment. Arguably, we all had the same rides. So in, in those days, I was the head of opera and music theater at the conservatory and uh, Hell, all my students needed summer employment, and uh, why not Kings Island? So there were musical shows, comedy shows, dance shows, country and western barbershop quartets, clown bands, you know, train rides, melodramas, uh, magicians, jugglers, mimes, and clowns. So uh, the early years, probably you know, a couple hundred plus uh, 
aspiring young performers, you know, many from CCM in Cincinnati, but many, many from Bloomington, University of Michigan, et cetera. So we build an air structure. I don't know if you remember the old air structure by the Eiffel Tower. We couldn't build a big, massive theater as much as we wanted to. We couldn't build it in the early years. So we built this air structure with a revolving door to keep the air pressure in, and we'd have the, uh, the live show kids in that air, air uh, structure, and it was extremely popular. And again, all these people that came in that remembered Coney Island, they didn't know they were going to get live sh porpoise shows. We had a marvelous porpoise show. And they got all these shows for free, and I mean, there, it was such a big bang for the buck. Uh, Saltwater Circus, very popular show at Kings Island. It was actually uh, over on the south side of the park behind the Eiffel Tower uh, between Rivertown and uh, the carousel coming up to Coney Island Mall. There was an area there, and it was, uh, it was packed. It was uh, full every show. Uh, it was r really one of the few dolphin shows, uh, certainly in the region, if, if not the only one. So, uh, again, like everything else uh, in our industry, everything runs its course after a while, uh, and, you, and you change it. Uh, and, of course, with the Marine Mammal Act and other uh, uh, legislation, there was a lot of pressure on keeping uh, dolphin, particularly, in captivity and working with them. So, uh, eventually, we just uh, eliminated that show and took the, uh, took the dolphin show out. Uh, you know, over the year, there's been uh, a lot of famous Cincinnatians. I guess the most notable that everyone would recognize today would be Carmen Electra. At the time, she went by Tara Patrick, and uh, she was a dancer in our stage show, It's Magic, in 1990. So, uh, you know, she's gone on to, to a level of fame. Uh, but she also had, you know, going back to the 70s, uh, you know, Miss America Susan Perkins was a performer in 1978 at the park. Uh, you had Susan K. Johnson in 1987. She was Miss Ohio. She was here in the mid-'80s, you know, for a couple of years working in our stage shows uh, at the International Showplace. Theater, uh, Nick Lachey, you know, he was a performer here as well with the Barbershop Quartet in, the, you know, the early 90s. So you've had, you know, a lot of people like that that have kind of come through. Then a lot of people that, you know, y if you work in the industry or something, you may know who these people are, you know, whether they work at the Clear Channel, like Chuck Ingram uh, was a guy that worked here, Janine Coyle from WGRR. So there's been a lot of people over the years that have worked at Kings Island have gone on to bigger and better things. I try to. I mean, I had hopes and dreams and you know, wanted to move to either New York or Hollywood and, and try to start a career. I think when, whether you're a dancer or an actress or a musician working in entertainment, you, you have to follow your heart. You have to, you have to go with it. And I, you know, saved up my money from working here, which, you know, was a little, little bit and, um, got on a plane and flew to Los Angeles and just decided to go for it. And I mean, I really thank Kings Island so much for, for being a part, a part of that because, I mean, even without, you know, the paycheck from working every week, I wouldn't have been able to go. So in, in, in so many ways, you know, I'm really honored and this is just, it's so cool. I'm trying not to cry because <laughs> I, I don't want my makeup to run. <laughs> No other street in the world crosses this many international boundaries. We've uncovered a lot of hidden history behind this iconic street inside of Kings Island, and I hope we've uncovered a lot of memories for you.